talk. I actually hope to not spend the entire hour, but to uh, stimulate conversation here, because I think one of the things I've really gained from this uh, meeting is, is a wonderful conversation. So start saving up your questions as soon as I start here. Uh, this is my uh, thank you slide and my conflict of interest uh, slide. And, uh, I'll the, uh, how grateful I am to uh, these uh, uh, as those students and postdocs along the way. And when when we ask or why what is it that we need in order to really make a dent into the wonderful biology that lies behind uh, uh, long long term health uh, uh, and immortality and so forth. I felt that these were some of the really critical tools that we needed for reading and writing. Interpreting poems is, is part of it, but we needed to have a way of sharing this data where we have a unique cohort for sharing uh, precision medicine and uh, hopefully longevity data as well. We need to not only be able to sequence from the genome, but we need to be able to look at the, at the complex epigenetics, which is at, at subset of the resolution for multicellular uh, tissues uh, during the aging process. And then uh, we need a way of doing both genomic and epigenomic engineering, and I'll show you some of that that we call CRISPR, and why we're, everyone's so excited about CRISPR. And then finally, as a, a kind of an example of, of why you need really advanced uh, technologies, I'll talk about uh, xenotransplantation of organs on chips, just very briefly. Now this shows that we've been making progress in aging for over 150 years, so it's roughly the time that the Sense Foundation started. And, uh, and, uh, but the problem with this plot is that it's going at about a slope of 0.28, meaning that even if this keeps going at this rate, we will get older and older on average, but we'll never get to immortality. To do that, we need to have a slope of one, and. Uh, and that's that red line up, up extending from this year, 2013, uh, and so forth. And that's and the question is, how do we get change that slope? And you might say with a curve that's really that that straight with a for so many years, it's daunting to expect a change of slope. But I will present a number of slopes that have changed recently, and that's what in a positive way like this. And you'll see what I'm talking about. Here's one example of a slope that's changed, and might have been daunting that. Both the Moore's Law curve and the DNA uh, sequencing curve were perfectly aligned at a 1.5 fold per year uh, exponential slope. You might say, you know, game over, it's not going to change unless we cut off the funding, in which case it could, one of them could flatline. Uh, fortunately, when the funding for the Genome Project dropped off at the end of that green uh, sequencing curve, it didn't, uh, it, it didn't flatline. And it didn't even go under the exponential extrapolation of six decades. Instead, it took just six years because it changed slope dramatically. It is now, we've been paying on the order of $2,000 a genome. The costs are probably close to $1,000 a genome now. And it will continue to plunge uh, into the hundreds, low hundreds uh, over the next few years. But it's not just about cost, it's also about quality. And the quality has also undergone exponential improvement. And the exponential has also improved uh, over the years. I mean, there's, there's not quite as much data here, but, but error rate has dropped from sort of around 10 to the minus 3, where it was pre-genome project, to 10 to the minus 7, where it was in our Nature paper just a year ago. And the haplotype phase length, meaning that how, how you can interpret whether things are in the same chromosome or on uh, different chromosomes, mother and father's chromosome, um, has improved. Um, so now that it's in the order of almost uh, three million base pairs, uh, this is without any any family resources. So both the error rate, half height, phase length have been improving exponentially, and that progress has been improving. The rate has been improving as well. But to get at, at the long youth uh, and health is not just a matter of uh, informatically going from your diploid genome to your traits in some highly predicted manner. We have the million-fold improvement we've had in, tech, in, in reading uh, genomes. This also applies to many of the intermediates that help us understand uh, how you get from genomes to traits. And this includes measurements of environmental components in red and epigenetic components in, in, uh, in green which kind of blur uh, uh, into one another. 
And so we can not only get the personal inherited genome, but immunomics, immune response to microbiomics, and as we've seen in some of the previous talks, the microbiome is, is uh, extremely important in, uh, in aging and inflammation and so forth. And we have epidemics that in the past, when we had an epidemic, we would blame it on microbes, but, but epidemics like uh, obesity, diabetes, and, and autism, we do not yet have consensus on whether it's microbiome or not. But certainly it's a component that's been missing from many of the GWAS studies. So we have a, uh, an organization that's the world's only open access source for genes and genomes, environments, and traits called the Personal Genome Project. It's now international in the United States and Canada. Uh, a couple of European have, have approval, uh, and, and uh, we're actively uh, excited about other uh, countries and institutions joining. Here's an example of an, an annual event uh, in, in Boston where the volunteers, because they're, uh, some of them are non-anonymous, uh, it's not required that you uh, announce your name, but many of them do, and they can go to this meeting and they can uh, learn, uh, much like this meeting, what the cutting edge is in, uh, in genomics. And so they are, we are not only collecting genomes, environments, and traits, but uh, stem cells from these individuals and microbiomes, and, uh, diverse set of traits, anything. It's like Wikipedia, anything, any trait that you think is missing, uh, you, can, you can add, you can improve. Uh, here's examples of uh, teratomas from the, from the PGP stem cell lines. These are now available from Coriel. <clears throat> and in order to get this kind of open sharing, uh, we require 100% on exam. It just means that people know what they're getting into. Uh, they're not necessarily revealing their identity, but with all medical research, we make the, the claim that data can get out and get re-identified, so we just try to educate them in advance. And we'll come back to some of this uh, neuro, neurobiology uh, in a moment. This is uh, uh, taken hold in the, now the, the ENCODE project, the, the, the uh, NIH uh, GenBank, is uh, working with the PGP, and the NIST and FDA are establishing genome standards uh, for the uh, for genomes, and and they decided that after looking around the world that there was only one project that was properly consented, and so they're starting their standards with eight trios, twenty four uh, cell lines from the PGP. Now, I mentioned earlier we made progress on both uh, error rate and haplotype phase. Um, this was, this was published in Nature uh, 2012, and then there's a new one uh, in genome biology uh, just coming out in the next few days, where you can uh, determine whether, let's say the Cs are, are positive alleles for, for a, a extreme trait, either deleterious or, or, or not. Uh, it makes a difference whether you're uh, in cis, so as to say, affecting both copies, or, or one copy of the gene and the other one's fine, or affecting both copies uh, on the right there. Uh, that's the difference between one good copy and zero good copies. This is a gigantic difference both for clinical and research. So that's one, that's the happy by phase consequences and then the one error in 10 million is a 100 fold improvement over the previous year but uh, we hope to improve that uh, until there's less than one error per genome. This is done with 10 cells, so we, we distribute the, the, the material from 10 cells. It may not sound like very many, uh, but you'll see in a moment that 10 cells is, is quite, quite a few uh, because we can get away with single cells and less than cells, less than a single cell. Because for epigenomics, uh, subcellular is actually significant, the distribution of RNAs and proteins. And this has been a very difficult problem. Also. You can't just randomly assemble genomes and, and say that describes the one-dimensional structure. It's, it's a very coarse, you lose information there, and that's one of the reasons we don't have a whole genome yet. Furthermore, you lose the three-dimensionality of the, of the transcriptome and, and other uh, aspects of uh, epigenetics. When you do go into three dimensions in cell biology and so forth, you're typically limited to one or four colors. Um, but the alternative that I'll show you just now is that you can have four of the N colors, where N is the number of next generation sequencing cycles. This is one of the motivations why we started developing next generation sequencing in the late 1990s, 
and we called it back then fluorescent in situ sequencing or FISI. And uh, finally, 13 years later, we have something that, that does that. So uh, even something as simple as the little punch of skin that we that we take from many of our volunteers to establish our, our fibroblast and stem cell lines, that contains on the order of 57 different cell types. So when you say that I'm I've got a transcriptome for skin, that doesn't that's meaningless. You've got a transcriptome for all kinds of stuff going on there. And uh, we really want to know in detail, whether it's a brain a section or, or skin, what all the cell types are doing. And, and you can see the cell types are also asymmetric, and many of them are post-mitotic. So you can't just grow up a big batch of, of you know, these uh, cell types. Um, so this is the uh, so-called FISI, fluorescent in situ sequencing. The libraries are now, typically, if you wanted to analyze single cell RNA, you might dissect out a single cell, uh, go through manipulations to make a library, then throw that library randomly down on a slide again, um, and then do next generation, next generation sequencing. The philosophy here was instead of taking it out of its context and putting it back onto a slide, just leave it on the slide where it is and uh, uh, amplify it very lightly so it's still a, a dot, uh, a spatially confined in three dimensions. And then this, this is basically the protocol A, B, you know, through E. It's reverse transcriptase on a fixed tissue so that you want to, you know, you fix it in, so it's sort of like a plastic. Uh, the reverse transcription has um, I mean, introduced amino groups, which, are, which you can do a further round of fixing, circularization with circ ligase, and then sequencing can be done by any of the next-gen methods ranging from sequencing by polymerase or sequencing by synthesis and sequencing by ligation. Anything that uh, clues is fluorescence. In the process of this cross-linking and, and fixation, we also make it uh, quite clear the tissue is uh, transparent to most of the wavelengths we're interested in. And this is the work of, of the postdoc Jay Lee and uh, Evan Doherty, a graduate student, and others. Now, one of the problems with leaving it where it was is the density of RNA is fairly low. It's not dramatically uh, low, uh, or sorry, the density is very high. It's not, it's not so high that you can't handle it. It's a, on the order of 100 nanometers uh, between the poly A sites of the, of the messenger RNAs. So there are three ways of, of uh, dealing with this. One is super resolution. I'll show you briefly yeah, one of each. Molecular stratification, meaning we do a subset of the RNAs and then we go back to the same sample, the same three-dimensional object, and do another subset that overlap. And finally, deconvolution, which is a, a computational. And all three of these uh, work. So here's an example of uh, some of the super resolution we did in collaboration with uh, Peng Yin's lab. We heard uh, yesterday a little bit about uh, nanostructures. These are highly uh, engineered uh, nanostructures where we've atomically designed uh, Anatomically precise DNA nanostructures over over micron scales, but the important thing is not as at the other end where we can put fluorescent uh, signatures 42 nanometers apart, so you can see all these different colorful patterns, which are on the on the order of uh, 10 to 40 nanometer resolution. And so these can be used as barcodes in their own right, but here I'm just referring to them as as progress in uh, in super resolution. The second one is this molecular stratification. You can think of it one, there are many ways to think of it. That one is, let's say you have a specific primer to the end of a, of a poly A. This is just one example. If you just put oligo DT, it can ra randomly prime anywhere. Up. But if you put oligo DTC, then it will prime at, at the end of the poly A or, and, uh, and only get the subset that end in C. So that's one third. If you extend, say, CC, then it'll get 1 12 because it's the first three times four and so forth. And then you can come back and backfill all the, all the other ones. And so that's, this is an example of that where um, if you have uh, no specificity, or if you're looking at all the amplicons, you get very dense, then you get 25% uh, detected and 6% and, uh, and detected uh, by uh, intentionally. And then this is deconvolution. In this case, we're looking at uh, randomly primed uh, transcripts throughout the, the, the uh, cell. And you can see about a tenfold improvement in resolution due to deconvolution. Now, these are, these are three-dimensional images. This is a projection. We have the full three-dimensional data, which is important. 
One of our quality assessments uh, 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 is that we look, uh, we search for both uh, strands of the RNA. We know from previous sequencing which strand tends to be used, uh, and we see about 97 percent uh, of our plate reads are placed onto the sense strand, the correct strand, and the the other three percent could could be real or they could be uh, artifacts. But the point is, it's very very uh, high quality. Um, Okay, so that so we've talked about this open uh, uh, sharing uh, capability that fluorescent NCQ sequencing, which allows us to do uh, transcriptomes and, and uh, possibly other epigenomics in situ. But now we want to start engineering. We want to start engineering biological systems so that uh, so that we can uh, make progress on on aging and therapeutics. Now, in the, let me uh, put this in the context of uh, of where we are for. For genome analysis, uh, that there is a, a, a misunderstanding that genomic analysis doesn't uh, doesn't work. Uh, that human genome sequencing is premature. It's actually uh, working quite well. There, there have been uh, many. Uh, there are about 2,600 uh, genetic diseases for which they're highly predictable and medically actionable. Um, and here's some. Uh, examples where in some of these cases there was no, there was little or no pre existing knowledge, and there was no way you could say in advance you should do this test for this gene, which is the way it's typically, human genetics has typically been practiced. You, you either don't have family history, you're the first one in the family. And so you have examples like uh, Nick Volker, who had uh, uh, intestinal problems that once he was sequenced turned out to be an immune problem with the IXAP gene, solved by cord blood transfer. Um, Beery twins uh, have uh, oral, orally available um, neuronal precursors that now they take for serotonin and dopamine. They were misdiagnosed with cerebral palsy until they got genome sequenced. Uh, and an example from our personal genome project is John Lowerman, uh, presented at, at, as having leg pains and, and little dark spots in his uh, retina, these stotomas. And he had actually had a genetic test, the sort of the one gene test you typically get, which was uh, uh, in uh, the Factor V Leiden uh, allele, and, and he was, that was not what was causing it. So it's an example why if you test one gene, uh, you can come away with uh, what looks like a clean bill of health uh, genomically. But it turned out when you do the whole genome, he has a JAK2 mutation which is not even in his germline. So it's only because we did blood uh, that we found uh, this. So you have to be careful to do the whole genome and in some cases do multiple uh, different cell types. We uh, had the unfortunate uh, circumstance, uh, anybody that wants to complain about this, uh, you have my uh, endorsement to do so. There was an XPRIZE uh, that was supposedly going to deliver 100 uh, centenarian genomes at the end of this month. Um, they spent $7 million promoting it um, and didn't do anything. Uh, they canceled it recently. And with $7 million, we could have sequenced 3,500 genomes, including the 100 uh, centenary genomes. I think it's a, that's a, that's a, a pity, one could say. Uh, but, but there are other uh, studies, and we will have more centenarian genomes soon, and super centenarian. Here's some super centenarians. The take home from this uh, is not that you have to smoke and drink in order to live a long time, um, but that uh, perhaps they have protective alleles that protect them against the environments that all of us uh, share, some more than others. Um, and uh, so, what do I mean by protective alleles? Our, our, uh, our research community is mostly focused on deleterious alleles. Uh, and uh, I just realized I lost my mic. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. yeah. I guess so. Uh, I guess don't need the mic. Okay. Uh, so this focus on deleterious alleles and focus on, on worse yet, on alleles of, of, of small effects. I think much more powerful is look at for alleles of, with large effects. And you can do this with incredibly tiny cohorts. Now we're trying to recruit millions of people into the international. Uh, PGP, Personal Genome Project, but you can do things with single individuals. So as far as I know, there's only one human in the literature that has a myostatin uh, double null and a myostatin uh, receptor double null. That has not stopped us from making great progress in, in this particular uh, uh, human 
disease in quotes, um, in that uh, you can, it's quite dramatic when you look at a genome and you find a double null in a, in a, in a fairly uh, you know, well-used gene. And in this particular case, and in fact is a gold standard in general, is moving from the obsession with correlation where you need 10,000 people to get a small effect size in TWAS to, to causation. So the causative alleles can be tested in animals. Here's three different animal models. You don't necessarily have to do uh, cows to prove your point, but uh, cows, dogs, and mice, where the myostatin uh, double null is on the right for dogs and, and mice. Uh, and, uh, and this is, this is accompanied in some of these small organisms with decreased body fat and decreased atherosclerosis. Um, so this is a really interesting example of n equal one study and causality. It's also an example of rare protective alleles, and I would submit here some more examples, and we will hopefully we'll learn many more from the, from the most extremely uh, long-lived individuals. Uh, LRP5 alleles exist, such that you get extra strong bones that will break uh, surgical drills and saws. Uh, they also uh, have trouble swimming because they're so uh, dense. Uh, PCSK9 has inspired the drug industry uh, with, uh, because it has extraordinarily low uh, LDL cholesterol levels and, uh, and, the, and the race is on to get uh, antibodies and small molecule drugs that do the same thing. CCR5 and FUT2 are, are receptors for viruses. No that uh, knocking out receptors is not necessarily a general solution, but it works for these two viruses because there are people that have been walking around double null for both of these. This is the norovirus, and we'll come back to the HIV in just a moment. Now, APP, it, you might not think should be on the slide about protective alleles because it's, uh, uh, there are APP alleles that cause uh, a much higher probability. They're rare, deleterious alleles that cause higher probability of Alzheimer's. But this particular one uh, from Work and Decode, um, th this particular one actually uh, delays Alzheimer's by about a decade or so. So this is appropriately in this rare protective allele slide. So how can we get these rare protective alleles into the population as a whole? We're not trying to fix something that's rare, deleterious. We're trying to get something from a rare individual, or maybe something that's completely synthetic, into all the rest of us. And the answer is, is, uh, is, is the newly enhanced, re re rejuvenated field of gene therapy. Uh, and here's an example of one. The Sangamo has been running a clinical trial, which is now in phase two and is doing well, where they make a double null in uh, T cells. So they have, so it's uh, from the individual who could have full-blown AIDS, uh, making double null in the gene and co CCR5, which is a co-receptor for the HIV. This, uh, uh, enables uh, this it is important in two respects. One is it's a, it's it's uh, not curing a deleterious rare allele, but it's something that essentially all of us are at risk for. And furthermore, it's not adding a new gene in the typical gene therapy; it's subtracting something, which requires more precision. And so that we've already heard a little bit about the the, the uh, zinc finger nucleases and the talons, and I'll show you an alternative in just a moment. So these are are the various methods for doing genome engineering. And we've worked on essentially almost all of these from from the very, very beginning, when they were uh, from a time when they were didn't look like they were even good uh, genome engineering tools. Um, there are two that are based on RNA, mainly. The RNA does the recognition of the sequences of the group two introns and CRISPR, and come back to that. And then, then there are five based on proteins. Um, we've used the Lambda Red systems as specific so far for E. coli, but you can pre-engineer things in E. coli and then put them into mammalian systems. Uh, this has allowed us the largest number of simultaneous mutations on the order of a dozen uh, in a few hours. Uh, CRISPR allows us to get large numbers simultaneously, uh, more like on the order of, of, of three to six, um, directly in human cells. Now, how do you choose among these? This, this, this topic has come up a little bit earlier today. Um, and I would say that uh, why do we need uh, null mutations? Do we need gene replacements rather than insertions? Um, and why do we need multiplexing? Rather than just making one gene change, we might want to make uh, many. Uh, for these diseases that are uh, like aging, which probably involves multiple genes, we want to be able to do multiplexing. And as an example is of xenotransplants. This has been a field, an idea that's been around for a while that we can uh, 
we have a shortage of, of organ donors if we grew them in some animal like pig is one of the fav favorite ones. Uh, and we had to make them, uh, unlike the, the CCR5 mutation where you made it uh, histocompatible uh, by taking it from the same individual, uh, we, need, we have need for a large number of, of organs. And the barrier to using a, 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 another mammalian species like pig is that they, most non-primates express uh, uh, sugar groups like this one is alpha-gal. Uh, they have uh, multiple, a half dozen um, major histocompatibility uh, loci, complement and clotting fact incompatibilities as well. But with a couple of dozen changes, uh, you, you might be able to make uh, real progress here. And there has been progress already uh, made with just the primitive genome engineering that we had uh, recently. Uh, I mentioned multiple protective alleles. We'd like to harvest every uh, really uh, protective allele that we find in the super centenarians and put them together and see whether they uh, work together or not. And then libraries, we'll come back to this in a moment. Something that was very hard to do one gene a few years ago, we're now doing hundreds of thousands, and you'll see that in just a minute. This has really taken off. This field started in 1987 with this paper from Michono et al., uh, which was E. coli, a piece of junk DNA. Basically, it was the DNA that everybody advised me not to sequence when I was young. Um, it, that's where all the CRISPRs were, in this repetitive, non-conserved DNA. Um, but it wasn't until January of this year that we realized that it could be used for, as a technology, and we published its use in human cells, and then since then it's been used in almost every model organism, just in eight months, all these uh, uh, groups, uh, and it's really a wonderful community, very sharing. Now, this is uh, Prashant Mali and uh, Lu Han Yang, who were co-first authors on this uh, January paper and many papers since then. Um, and they were focusing on homologous recombination, not merely adding a new gene or, or uh, making a mess with non-homologous injoining, but getting a precise targeting. Here they targeted two base pairs very close along the and nearly overlapping uh, uh, targeting. And, uh, and here, 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 this is made not by just protein recognition, but RNA, guide RNA, that recognizes and makes a triple-stranded uh, structure. And then you can introduce either a double-strand break, which is what the, the uh, Cas9 uh, protein RNA complex does straight out of the box in vivo, uh, or, you, or we can mutate it so it only makes a nick, and you'll see the advantage of that in a moment. Or no, no cuts at all, no nicks, uh, and that has utility for epigenomic programming. So Prashant and Luhan tested this and found, and we already had uh, helped develop the field of talons, which was slightly better than uh, zinc fingers, more, more programmable and slightly more efficient in our hands. But this, here's the talons, uh, in terms of the percent rate of homologous recombination, allele replacement here. These were, uh, depending on the site, you get a nine to 22 fold uh, enhancement of rate. And, and, the, and the ease is, is hard to overstate. This, we just have to make 20 base pairs of sequence. It's a short oligo and insert that into a standard vector. These vectors are freely available through AdGene and, uh, and uh, thousands of people have, have labs have, are, have uh, accessed them that way. So this was done by a fax fact assay, but we've done a lot of endogenous genes since then as well. Susan uh, Byrne and colleagues in our group have uh, shown, again, it's very site-specific where you make the double-strand breaks, and you can engineer up to, this is 83 kilobase region, where we're going from between left one or left two uh, site, making a cut at that end, and making a cut at the other end, 80-some kilobases away, and you can see it makes a difference whether you do left one or left two here. You can get up to 20% efficiency without selection. This is without any selectable markers. It's, it's scarless other than the intended uh, mutation. Susan uh, also did this re uh, replacement, uh, replacing, we can replace a human thigh one locus with a mouse and vice versa. We can pop them back and forth. Uh, and we can get on the order of 6.7% 6, 6 uh, replacement, again, without uh, selection. If we use both the left and right guide RNA cleavage, and uh, significant but reduced if you just use left or right, and essentially no background if you don't use either uh, RNA. But this doesn't stop with, uh, with uh, 
genomic uh, changes, we can make epigenomic changes, and we just uh, uh, published some of this uh, 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 recently, where we can put effector molecules, these can be affecting uh, uh, methylation of the DNA or of the, of the histones, it can be uh, silencing or opening up of chromatin, it can be direct uh, uh, transcriptal activation. These protein domains can be locked onto the Cas9 protein, or they can be put onto the Cas9 guide RNA. Um, either place work, they both work. Uh, we can use this for, for regulating multiple loci simultaneously. And one of the questions that keeps coming up is, how high do we need to have uh, uh, the precision, the, 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 not, the, the uh, specificity, and, uh, and how high can we get it? And, and how do we, just like sequencing, I showed you that sequencing quality has been exponentially improving. This is happening with the quality of, of uh, homologous recombination and gene replacement. So you can computationally pick sites that have nothing near them in the genome, uh, computationally. Then you can do empirical searches like this ones I showed you before, where we had nine to 22 fold improvement, so that, uh, where we had uh, the big range. So, so you, you can do computational to pick sites that are very specific, and then empirical to find the ones that are efficient and specific. We can use NICs rather than double-strand breaks, and the NICs tend to be much more uh, ready to do homologous recombination, much less ready to do non-homologous in-joining. Um, we can require two or more sites. That means that the probability being off-target is more or less p squared if you have two sites um, rather than just p if you have one such site. Um, and we can use this for both for genomic and epigenomic. And I'll, I'll show you the epigenomic here and it illustrates the point of getting specificity by having proximity. Here you can see that if we have one uh, activator, or we haven't made uh, much effort to make these very efficient, intentionally we want them to be inefficient. Um, so these are sort of in the few percent, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, uh, two to three fold uh, improvement. Um, but if you put them together, so all these little uh, yellow tri triangles indicate places that you can position it relative to the start site of transcription, minus 2.6 to 0.8. As you build up more and more of these, you start getting up into uh, 35 and even 100 fold uh, increase in, in activation. And this just came out in Nature Biotech. Now, we want to scale this up from, from just one gene at a time to whole libraries of genes so we can, again, get that empirical search, find the best, the most efficient, the most specific sites in the genome, but also to fully explore the epigenetic landscape. And we do this with a variety of uh, next generation synthesis methods that, that we and others said that we work quite closely with all these companies from the very beginning uh, when they first started up. Um, and these include methods of getting photo deep, deep protection, uh, like photolithography. These are all inspired by Silicon Valley, but applied here to chemistry and biology, where you have this mu mu digital micromirror device, kind of like the projector that we might be using right now, uh, where each of these little micromirrors under transistor control and you reflect the, the light to cause deep protection in a flow cell. Or you can have an inkjet printer where instead of four colors, you have four. Uh, ACGNT, and you build up uh, uh, oligomers that can be up to 300 uh, base pairs long, and then they can be error corrected and assembled into uh, uh, genes and genomes. Now we want to apply this to the, the uh, genetic, genomic and epigenetic uh, reprogramming. And John Ock is one of the, our bioinformatics uh, leaders who uh, has designed a uh, uh, and we've now synthesized almost 200,000 of these guide RNAs. This is something we would dream of doing a few years ago with the, with the zinc fingers of talons. Um, this covers 90% of the human genes, and we've, we're covering not only uh, transcription factors, DNA and RNA binding proteins, but long non-coding RNAs and uh, microRNAs. Uh, these are particularly key in doing the kind of stem cell reprogramming that we'd like to be able to do. What we, what we feel that we're close to, and there are many demonstrations of this, is that you, you're not limited to just going from, say, fibroblasts to stem cells, the pluripotent stem cells. You can almost go from any cell to any other cell. And the, and the limitations of this, uh, we're just beginning to explore. Is, is there an example of two cells which are not connected uh, by uh, epigenetic uh, reprogramming? 
So for example, here's a, here's a, a trace through uh, from fibroblast induced pluripotent stem cells off towards neurons, and we'll develop that in just a moment. So here is, the, these are a, a, a personal genome project, which is our favorite cell lines because they're properly consented. These are induced pluripotent stem cells. Back here is fibroblast that led to these. But in a mere four days, we can get quantitative shift on the order of 98 plus percent that are now changed to not just generic neurons, but a very specific kind of neuron, two different neurotransmitters, uh, uh, gabaminergic and glutaminergic, and a precise morphology where you have exactly two uh, processes coming out at the ends. We, we call these bipolar neurons. These are da doxycycline inducible, so you can have a, a large vat of, uh, of the replicating cells producing a large vat of the post-mitotic cells um, quantitatively. So you, it's one of the few ways that you can get large numbers of pure uh, cells for things like uh, chromatin IP, that, which you can't really do at the single cell level just yet. You can do uh, patch clamp uh, neuro uh, um, modulation and measurement here. So you can see that these are making uh, action potential spikes. And we've done RNA sequencing uh, on, on these uh, <clears throat> bipolar neurons. And you can, you can build up uh, uh, a, not only a, a functional <coughs> idea of what this cell is thinking, but more importantly, we can ask if our target were a slightly different neuron, and we wanted to go from IPS to, say, tripolar rather than bipolar, you could, you could measure the RNA-seq of these all three cells and ask, what, what would we have to do differently to take it in a new epigenetic direction? And I think that's one of the things that we look forward to doing with these libraries of CRISPR uh, guide RNAs because it allows us to, to either go up in, in activation, go up in level of, of key regulatory molecules, or to go down, and not just go down a little bit as uh, short hairpin uh, silenced uh, <coughs> RNAi goes, but to go all the way down to zero by getting double nulls. So we're exploring this epigenetic landscape and trying to develop a general protocol where we can go from any cell to any other by looking at the two uh, epigenomes, the two RNA transcriptomes, and asking what would we have to change at the regulatory level to get there. And finally, uh, we can do this in the context of, uh, I mentioned the xenotransplantation, but we can also do it human uh, increasingly complicated human tissues uh, that my colleague uh, Don Ingber and uh, Kit Parker and uh, William Koo all uh, use uh, this term organs on chip, where, where you have uh, complex multicellular structures where really the, the physiology is only well represented once you have multicellular structures with mechanical forces on them, like in the lungs, you, you not only have these two cell layers, epithelial and endothelial, but you have an air layer, you have a blood layer, and the stretching that occurs that, uh, in breathing. And only then do you see all kinds of interesting physiological. Now what we've done together with Bill Koo's lab and, and uh, Kit Parker is use this uh, cardiac muscle on a chip. Uh, a chip here means PDMS, uh, it's an elastomer. Uh, in fact, for all of these, it's a PDMS elastomer. Um, and, uh, <coughs> and then uh, simulated a human disease uh, uh, that, that, that involved um, mitochondrial cardiolipin. And this is done by taking some of, one of the PCP uh, <coughs> stem cell lines, reprogramming it with, with uh, dox, doxycycline inducible Cas9 to make three different kinds of, uh, of uh, derivative genomes. One is the, is the wild type non-changed one is this, this uh, human mitochondrial disease, uh, which differs by one base pair, a, a G versus an A. And then, uh, uh, and then I'm sorry, uh, and, and then the non-homologous injoining, which in this case results in, in inserting uh, material. This is, uh, uh, here's, here's some examples of those mutations. So if you make the mutation, you get a, a, a great reduction in cardiolipin. Composition, so you can show that this is a ca kind of causative uh, alleles, uh, the way of looking at causality rather than just correlation, because you can change one allele out of the millions that differ from person to person, and then you can change it back, which is a form which you can think of as gene therapy, uh, and show this dramatic uh, 
set of physiological changes, including the contractility that you can get from the speeding uh, heart muscle on a ship. So I have uh, gone through uh, this quite quickly uh, with plenty of time for discussion. These are, this is what I consider some of the prerequisites that we can contribute uh, and uh, that hopefully all of you can find some, some utility for, for these various technologies, whether it's uh, epigenomic uh, sequencing at the single cell level with physique, actually it's multicellular or subcellular, um, or uh, the ways that we can share data on, on real living people living out their precision medicine lives, um, and uh, ways that you can do multiplexed uh, genome epigenome engineering. Uh, where it's not just one change you want to make, but many to look for synergies and, uh, and uh, combinations that don't work uh, just as important. So I'll open it up for, um, for discussion now. Thank you. Oh.